In order for us to appreciate the text, we must look at the context, the wider context uh, of this passage. Because in chapter 13, the previous chapter, Paul is addressing the issue of spiritual gifts in the context of love. That is, spiritual gifts must not be exercised devoid of love. For if spiritual gifts are exercised devoid of love, then it accomplishes nothing. Then in our chapter, in, verse, in chapter 14, he begins the chapter in verse 1 saying what we ought to pursue. Verse 1 he says, pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. So our focus should be the pursuit of Christian love, to grow in the grace of love so that we can be a means of edification to one another as we earnestly love one another. And then, thereafter, as we are pursuing love, as we are growing in the grace of love, we ought to seek or desire the spiritual griefs. But the essential thing is that we pursue to grow the <coughs> grace of love. And then we seek to use the spiritual gifts for the edification of one another. The gifts are the, for the edification of believers. That is primary. And we see Paul is making an emphasis of that because in verse 4 he says, The one who prophesies builds up the church, edifies the church, builds up the church. And in verse 5 he says, The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets, and notice this, so that the church may be built up, so that the church may be edified. And even in the context of the passage that we are covering today, verses 26 to 40, notice the emphasis on edification as well. Verse 26, let all things be done for building up. Verse 31, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. What's the role of prophecy here? To teach so that people can learn and thereby the saints can be encouraged. And we see in verse 33, he says, God is not the God of confusion, but the God of peace. What he's referring to here is if everyone is prophesying at the same time, you don't have peace. What you have is confusion. No one understands anything that is going on. I remember when I was uh, growing up as a young boy between ages of 7 to 10 thereabout, I was living with my grandmother and uh, she was renting one building. Half of the building was our apartment and the other half was a church. And my grandmother would take me to the uh, Roman Catholic Church, we would leave for church in the morning while the church in the same house <laughs> has begun. My uncle used to attend that church. When we come back, they were still going on. And I remember I used to love to go peep as to what is going on on the inside because this person is shouting, ah, and this person is shouting something else, and another person is shouting something else. The cheers are all over the place. People are screaming, and they fall into a trance. And then after the worship service, I would mimic it with my friends. It was just chaotic. That was a place of confusion. <laughs> This is exactly what the Apostle Paul is referring to. God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. 
So we see the context is that of edification with the use of the spiritual gifts. Our passage then is divided into three sections. First, we have orderly spontaneity in worship, that is verses 26 in verse 33, and then silence of women, verses 33 to 38, and then we have the concluding summary in verses 39 to 40. So the first division or the first section is orderly spontaneity in worship. Now to be spontaneous means that something just come up. It just happened. You didn't plan for it. It just happened. It spontaneously happened. And Paul is saying even in this context, it must be orderly. So he addressed this orderliness looking at tongues and secondly looking at prophecy. Let's look at tongues, verses 27 to 28. Verse 27 says, If any speak in a tongue, let there be only one or two at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. Notice what he says in verse 27. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or three, or at the most three, and let each speak in turn, and let someone interpret. In the service, there must be a maximum of three people speaking in tongues. Why? Why is it it's a maximum of three? Because the goal of speaking in tongues in worship is for the service of the people. It is not self-centered speaking in tongues. We don't speak in tongues so we can show who the Holy Spirit has gotten hold of me. I don't speak in tongues so that we can show that I am more spiritual than you because I've got the power. No. That's not the point of speaking in tongues, but rather it is to serve others. That's why he puts a condition here. Let someone interpret. Someone must interpret the unknown tongue. It is a language that the, generally the hearers do not understand, and most likely even the speaker does not understand it, but it is an intellectual or an intelligible language, and therefore it can be interpreted. For example, I speak French Creole. So I could say, en poise, mon calé parle en langage ou pas ça Did you understand? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it must be interpreted. See, what I said is now I am speaking a language you do not understand. Therefore, it was not edifying to you. So Paul is saying, don't speak in a language that is not edifying to the hearers. If you do, there must be someone <coughs> to interpret the language so that the hearers can benefit. Look at what he says in verse 28. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. If there is no one to interpret the tongue, quiet. Don't speak. That's what he's saying. If there's no one to interpret the tongue, therefore what you're going to say cannot edify anyone. Keep your mouth shut. That's what he's saying. Now, interestingly here, there seem to be a private use of tongues because he says, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Meaning that when you're at home, speaking to God in an unknown tongue, that's okay. Because at home, the goal is not to edify anyone. It is you speaking alone to God. Therefore, go ahead and speak in tongues 
without an interpreter because it is only you and God involved. At home, we see verse 2 is most likely alluding to that. It says, For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him. He's speaking to God, and therefore he's speaking to God alone at church. At home, sorry. At church, communication must be intelligible, communication must be understandable, and it must be orderly. That's why he says, let only two or at most three, and let each speak in turn. That is, the first person speaks in an unknown language, an interpreter interprets, then a second person speaks in an unknown language, an interpreter interprets, then a third person speaks in an unknown language, an interpreter interprets, and that's it. No more tongues once the third person has spoken. That is the way Paul is prescribing for the worship service to be done. Well, after looking at tongues, he now turns to prophecy. And we see that in verses 29 to 33. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent for... You can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So notice what he says. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Paul is anticipating a rebuttal. Paul is anticipating one of the prophets saying, Hey, look, the prophecy just came. I just received the revelation. I can't hold back. The revelation come. I must speak. Paul said, no. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Wait your turn to speak. Do not speak while somebody else is speaking. And then he even puts the maximum number of revelations that should come. Free at most. That is, free prophets who have received a revelation can speak. After that, if you receive another revelation, keep quiet. Hold your tongue. Otherwise, it will be disorderly. Regardless of when you receive the revelation, there must be order in the church. Prophets have the ability to control themselves even when they receive a prophecy. Now, given that in those days, prophets were given direct revelation from God, Paul says the prophecies must be weighed. That is, others must judge what it says. Let two or three speak and let the others weigh what is said. Because in a context where people are receiving direct revelation from God, it is easy for people to claim that God gave them a revelation when God didn't give them any revelation. So Paul said that the prophecies that they <coughs> utter must be judged. It must be weighed. They must evaluate what the speaker says to see if it was truly from God. It reminds us of what the Bereans did when the Apostle Paul came and preached to them. The scripture says that they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So if the prophecies are to be judged, if they are to be weighed, what is the standard by which you weigh them? Well, the only standard 
is the Word of God. If the prophecy does not align with the Word of God, if the prophecy contradicts the Word of God, therefore it is a false prophecy. Do not listen to it. Now, in the context where prophecies are weighed by a standard which is the Word of God, that means that certain prophecies that we are hearing today are out of the purview of even being weighed by the standard of the Word of God. When you prophesy that Argentina is going to win the World Cup, how do we judge that? When you prophesy, next week, by this day, you shall receive a newborn baby, how do we judge that? Oh, next month you're going to get that promotion. I declare and I prophesy to you that that promotion is yours in the name of Jesus. How do you judge that? You see, such prophecies cannot be judged by the standard. The standard is, is the word of God. So Paul's instruction is that two or three prophets speak and let the other weigh what it said. The others must judge the prophecies that are being uttered <coughs> and thereby ensure that the prophecies that are being uttered are for the edification of the saints and not for the glory of the individual making the prophecy. Now, that brings us to his second area of orderly worship, silence of women, or rather, the conduct of women in church. Now, the context of this, um, the context of this writing is that of judging or weighing the prophecies. It does not mean that women cannot sing or cannot speak at all in church. We know that they can even prophesy because even in chapter 11 and verse 5, Paul wrote, Every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head and the context is within the local church. Therefore, women can speak in church. However, in the weighing of prophecies, women are to be silent. And here he's referring to the awkward situation of a husband who makes a prophecy and the wife yells from the back, Hey, that's not right. Take a look of this passage. This man doesn't know what he's talking about. Can you imagine the shame? Now, which husband would want to be in that situation? That's why the Apostle Paul says, if there is anything that they, the wives, desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. This presupposes that the husband is knowledgeable of what is going on. That most likely he is a prophet and his prophecies or the prophecies of all the prophets are being weighed and then the wife ask him at home about the evaluating the evaluation of the prophecy so we have said that paul divides this passage into three uh, topics one is that of spontaneity regarding tongues and prophecy secondly silence of women in church and lastly his summary, his concluding summary on the whole matter. And we see that in verses 39 to 40. So, brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. All things should be done decently and in order. That is the essential point that the Apostle Paul wants to bring across. Worship is not do as you feel, do as the Spirit leads. No. Worship has to be done in order, decently. There must be decorum in the worship service. 
And that's what Paul is focusing his attention on. <coughs> Therefore, in our day, in our context, prophecy is typically equated with preaching. Therefore, preaching must be biblically sound and orderly. And remember, Paul is talking about you don't have several people just speaking all at once. Rarely we see that in churches today. But what we see predominantly is preaching that is not biblically sound. If they had to weigh the prophecies to ensure that it was biblically sound, how much more must we seek to have preaching that is biblically sound rather than a person just spewing off whatever comes up at the top of his head at the moment. Preaching must seek to line itself up with the word of God and declare what God has said and not merely man's ideas. Secondly, he says that tongues without an interpreter must not be spoken. If there is no one to interpret the tongue, therefore it becomes disorderly. And if several people are speaking in tongues at the same time, it is even more so disorderly. Therefore, only one speak in tongue at a time, and it must be interpreted. You see, orderly worship is important to God. That's why God spent so much time to explain to us what the worship service must look like. And we must take heed of that in our church today. Therefore, we must recognize that the function of the gifts is to serve one another. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have come to the place where you recognize that you deserve the wrath of God for all of your sins, and you accept Jesus as the only one to make atonement, to pay for, to cover all of your sins, and you're resting in Him alone for your salvation, and not anything that you have done to save you, then you are a believer in Christ, and every believer in Christ has at least one spiritual gift. <coughs> but use that gift not for selfish gratification, but to edify the body of Christ. That's what Paul is communicating to us. And when we are gathered in church, we are gathered for mutual edification, not for personal gratification. Therefore, our worship will be orderly because we seek to serve one another in love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love and care uh, for us and how you have designed the church to function in an atmosphere of love, of mutual participation, and you have given us gifts, and we thank you for those gifts. And we pray, O oh God, that you would enable us to be zealous in using our gifts, but use it not for selfish glory, but for the honor and glory of your name as we build one another in love. Amen. Amen.